Okay, well, so I would like to say a little bit about um, focusing really on my well, some of the things that influenced me early in my career. And what's interesting is I wrote these slides before the conference, and there's a remarkable number of connections with things people have said already, as well as a few things that may be a little bit different. So let me just go back right to the beginning. And I did a third year numerical year algebra course um, taught by Ian Gladwell here, who some of you will know. He was here until 1988. Then he moved to Southern Methodist University where he spent the rest of his career. And the course was built around Stuart's book, Introduction to Matrix Computations. And what I clearly really remember about the course was Ian was writing, doing this thing of writing the course about one lecture ahead of the, the lectures. So he was writing the next lecture just the, the few days before it was being given. And he had the book. This was the only copy of the book in the university. So he had, he had it out of the library. <laughs> so contrast that student to, you know, today, nowadays, when you can download almost anything instantly in electronic form from the library. In those days, there was one book and the lecturer had the book and you couldn't get it. <laughs> um, and this, of course, was a fantastic book. I really want to emphasize what a great book that is. Um, I've been looking at it and using it a bit lately. So this was one of the first modern books on matrix computations. Um, and it hasn't really dated very much, actually, because he, uh, Pete concentrated on the, the real basics. <clears throat> um, key features of the book, it had a very good treatment of the QR algorithm, the first really modern treatment of that. It had an appendix on error analysis with a very nice relative error counter notation that I used quite a bit myself and helped me really get to grips with rounding error analysis. Um, so that's, a, I think, a great book. If you haven't ever looked at it, it's well worth having a look at. Um, it, as I say, it still hasn't really dated even, even today. One story about Pete, though. Um, <clears throat> 1986, he was an invited speaker at the State of the Art Conference in the American Arts in, in Birmingham. And uh, he could give the talk, <laughs> but he wasn't um, able to write the paper for the proceedings. <clears throat> so Mike Powell, one of the organizers, suggested to Pete that somebody else be asked to help write the paper. And I think he suggested me, and Pete said, OK, that's fine. So I went to the conference. I remember sitting in the front row making notes as Pete um, gave the talk. <laughs> At the end of the talk, Pete went to the back of the room and sat there and wrote up some notes on the talk, which he later gave me. It turned out what he gave me were beautifully written handwritten notes, um, which were the basis of the paper. So all I had to do was basically type them up in LaTeX, add a few equations, add a few references, and, and we had the paper. So a few weeks later, I sent it off to Pete. And apparently he was really impressed. He thought I'd done a fantastic job. And I think he'd forgotten how good the notes were that he gave me to work from. And no matter how much I tried to tell him that, he didn't quite believe it because I guess I, you know, I had the original copy. So one moral of the story is if as a young person you get asked to do something, say yes, because you never know what, what will come of it. <clears throat> Between my undergraduate degree and my MSc, Ian Gladwell lent me this book to read over the summer. Parlet's The Symmetric Eigenvalue Problem. Um, a really superb book. Um, again, at the time, it was um, a very modern treatment of the topic with lots of new material. Parlet's a great writer. Um, he had a very clever choice of notation. For example, he would only use symmetric letters for symmetric matrices. So A could be a symmetric matrix, B could not be. Um, and I know Bai also was heavily influenced by this book, and he could tell you a lot about it as well. So that's a really brilliant book. Um, <laughs> it's now been reprinted as a Siam Classic. So it'll be around forever in the Siam Classic series. And here's Beresford in Pisa in 2010. So that was another wonderful book. And again, it's, you know, it's not really dated. All, everything that's in there is still perfectly valid today. It also includes some very good discussion of rounding error analysis. So again, another source of information on rounding error analysis that I think really helped me. And then, well, one of the authors is in the audience, Margaret Wright, Philip Gill, and um, Walter Murray. <coughs> so I did an undergraduate optimization course um, taught by Will McLuhan in, in the third year, nonlinear optimization it was called. And the book had just come out. So I think this is on the reading list. And so I was able to use this for that course. So <coughs> why have I included it here? Because it's not numerical algebra, 
Well, because it has a strong numerical error algebra flavor and a strong numerical analysis flavor, and that fitted perfectly with my, with my background. Um, and there's a lot of things in that book that even today, you know, it's still the, the place to go. So for example, the one that stands out for me, modified Cholesky factorization, um, first appeared in book form in that book, still isn't in many books nowadays. And if you want to learn about that topic, start by reading this, that, that, that section of, of the book. So a really wonderful book. Um, it's been republished recently in the Sign Classic series again. So it will be around for, forever. Sign books never go out of print. And there's one other key thing about that book, actually, that it was one of the first books to be produced in tech. Now, to give context, tech was invented in 1978 by Don Knuth. The final version of tech was 1984, I think. So 1981 was in the middle of the development period of tech when it was constantly changing. So quite how Philip, Margaret and Walter produced a book in this very early tech, in the days before previewers, so remember there were no screens, you just had to type the tech in and then print it. And that was it, you couldn't check it in any other way. And print meant the expensive Stanford laser printer. Don't know how many cents per page it costs, but it must have been quite a lot of money. I think at Stanford we had machines where you could see it. Those sale machines? Not, not tech. No? Okay. Yeah. We so, just begged to you know, to let us use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm sure did. I mean, he... <laughs> that's a good topic for discussion over lunch on how you did a, a book in tech at that early time. But if you look at the book today, it still looks as, you know, it competes with any modern book in terms of the, the formatting, the teching and so on. So really good from that, from that point of view as well, of historical importance. <clears throat> now, when I was um, an MSc student, uh, you know about Charlie and his strong connections with Manchester. Uh, so he told us that he was working on a book. And um, I pre-ordered it, and it came. My copy came in early 1983. Matrix computations, Goldman and Lone. Um, and so this came during my MSc year. Um, the first edition with a great cover. <coughs> so this was um, absolute revelation for me. This was the most important influence on me in the early days, um, for lots of reasons. So first of all, <coughs> it was the first really up-to-date, thorough modern treatment of the subject uh, for quite a while. Um, it had a very nice um, pseudocode notation, MATLAB-like. It used MATLAB subscripting notation. Uh, for every algorithm, it gave an error bound, some rounding error analysis. Um, it covered rather unusual topics like uh, conjugate gradients with a, a very modern treatment, um, total least squares. So all the things we take for granted nowadays, many of them first appeared in textbook form here. But in particular, it was the first book that really use the SPD to the full. Now, that's something that we just, again, take for granted nowadays, but this was the first book to show that the SPD could be used for a whole host of different problems. Um, another one was the Procrustes problem, uh, which, which I learned about from here. Um, so that was a really fantastic book. My copy is somewhere in my loft, I can't find it, but I know it's every page is covered with, with uh, notes. Now, the only criticism of the first edition was that it was it had quite a lot of typos um, which I'm sure were the fault of the publisher. Um, <clears throat> I visited Cornell as, as the visiting assistant professor um, in the computer science department from 1988 to 1989. At that time, Charlie Van Loon was in the UK at Oxford and Harwell um, on sabbatical. So I had Charlie's office and I was essentially teaching his courses while he was away. And Charlie told me he was gonna do a second edition. So I volunteered to, to read drafts and give comments. So the way that worked was Charlie would work on a chapter, uh, print it out, probably Harwell. He'd FedEx it back to Cornell. I'd read it, write comments on. Charlie's secretary, Cindy, would FedEx it back to Harwell. And we iterated that way on through the whole book, which was really great for me to be able to see this book as it was being created, this second edition. And it was in LaTeX, of course, for the first time. So that was a great opportunity for me to, um, to um, to be involved in, in, the, uh, in that way in the production of the second edition. And of course, there have been four editions in total now. Um, this is Charlie in his office in the, um, I think the late 70s or early 1980s. And Gene Golub, um, this was taken at UMIST in 2015 on one of his visits to Manchester, or 2005 rather. Okay, so that was a really important book and, and still is today, of course.
slightly less obviously, um, I'm going to mention Olga Towski and John Todd, who may not be known to all of you. Um, John Todd is a Northern Irishman. Um, Olga Towski was born in Austro-Hungary, Hungary, and um, during the Second World War, they were both working for the British government. Olga was working at the National Physical Laboratory on flutter problems. That's uh, trying to find unwanted vibrations in aircraft wings. And this boils down to quadratic eigenvalue problems. <coughs> and it's through that work, in particular the use of Gersh Goring's theorem, that led her to her famous work on um, diagonal dominance criteria for matrix non singularity. Um, and I quoted Hans Schneider there, who mentions that um, Towski's papers on this topic were, among with a few others, largely responsible for the huge growth in interest in matrix theory in, in the 50s and 60s. Um, the book by Todd at the top right is probably not that well known. I remember looking at it as an undergraduate. It's called numerical linear algebra. It's part of a, a series of two. <clears throat> it's got lots of practical examples, problems with solutions, lots of test matrices in there. I always found it a really fun book to read. And again, I've been looking at that, that recently as well. So that was, that was influential. Um, I met Olga once um, at the, the Gatlinburg 1984 meeting at Waterloo. Uh, she seemed a very nice, uh, very nice lady. And um, one of the reasons I've been looking at her work again recently uh, is something mentioned by Rob, uh, which is the Bohemian Matrix topic. So Bohemian matrices, and for those who weren't at Rob's talk, very roughly speaking, this means matrices of, with, made up of small integers. Um, that, that coincides or relates to a lot of what Towski did. Um, so you can see here the, uh, the cartoon that Rob showed, and <laughs> this is the 2008 workshop we had on Bohemian matrices um, picture with the t-shirt uh, developed by Rob and colleagues of a particular Bohemian eigenvalue problem. Now, the cartoonist here is John DePillis. And um, John has written, has done many cartoons for Siam News over the years, going back to the 1980s. And I first, I've met John twice. He actually visited Manchester a few years ago on part of a tour of Europe. But I first met him, and I don't know if Andy remembers this, you mentioned Lake Arrowhead, the householder symposium there where we, we met householder. Do you remember on the drive back from Lake Arrowhead with Nancy Nichols, Nancy said, I'd like to call in and uh, just have a you know, chat with John DePillis because he lives Riverside, it's on the way to the airport. So we stopped Andy, Nancy and me and, uh, and met John uh, before the next day getting our flight. So that, that was where I first met him. Um, and John kindly did cartoons for my Siam from the President series. Um, and this is one of the ones taken from that, um, it, it, my Siam News series when I was Siam President. Now, why am I saying a, a user guide is influential? Aren't these things rather boring and uninteresting? Well, half of that roughly is program listings. So in this case, in, in those days, you could list a complete package in the manual, just the whole Fortran code is there. Um, moderately interesting. Um, and there's some tables describing what the codes are, you know, again, moderately interesting. But the reason I've, I've shown that here is that the Limpact manual was unusual in that it also described the algorithms algorithmically. So if you wanted to know about Cholesky with complete pivoting for positive semi-definite matrices, which, which I did in, as a PhD student, then you could read the manual and it would tell you exactly how that was done. And there was no textbook that had that information. So this was great in terms of really defining uh, very carefully what the algorithms were, giving some error analysis. So it's almost like a textbook. It's no wonder it was what the science was best-selling book for many years and still available, I think, online. <clears throat> so that's, for me, that was a, a very, very useful um, book to have. <laughs> but there's one other reason why this is particularly notable. There was an appendix to the Impact User's Guide that listed the timings of um, Limpact running to solve probably, I think it was a 100 by 100 system on different computers around the country. And you probably can't read it, but there's timings here for uh, different computers. So this is sort of the genesis of the top 500 list, Jack's top 500, um, that's now twice a year up updated. And this is, I think, probably the first place um, where, where this um, appeared. And then later on, he, he published technical reports every six months or so, which then morphed into the actual top 500. So that was another feature of the Limpact manual.
I don't know if Ian Duff is still around. Is he in here? Uh, he's gone back. Okay. Well, so Ian Duff for many years edited something called the Imana Newsletter, the IMA Numerical Analysis Newsletter, and Jennifer Scott took it over in the later years. So this, this ran from probably the 1970s to the 2000s, and it was produced about three or four times a year. It listed recent preprints, upcoming seminars in numerical analysis all around the UK, recent PhD theses, who was visiting whom. It was incredibly useful. Um, and sadly, despite Google and the web, there's nothing like it today. You cannot easily find all that information today. Who's visiting who right now in NA in the UK? No idea. Um, but for many years, Ian was the, the editor. And he, he found out I was going to the Gatlinburg meeting in 1984. And they asked me if I'd write a report on the, on the conference for the newsletter. So again, I, I said, OK, I've never done this before. I'll give it a go. Um, and I still have my copy of the report. And you can see here, I picked, about, <laughs> picked out a little bit about um, MATLAB. So Cleve was there demonstrating on an IBM PC, which he'd brought to the conference, um, a very early version of MATLAB. And everybody liked it. You just sat down and <coughs> he would demonstrate MATLAB for you. But this was the non-commercial version of MATLAB in 1984. It was just a Fortran program he'd written to help his students use LIMPAC and ISPAC. And I made the comment in the article uh, that many people are using this in their research, um, sort of anticipating, I suppose, that MATLAB would become a commercial product a little later. Um, this is not from Gatlinburg, of course. This is a later photo from 2000 at Pete Stewart's 60th birthday conference. But that's sort of thing Cleveland many, many times over the years, demonstrating MATLAB uh, to an audience. One other story about Gatlinburg. Um, so I went to that conference and Sven was going as well. And we'd had some contact <coughs> by mail and e email. Um, and we, we found out we're on the same flight from Heathrow, but we hadn't met. So I, I said, well, how are we going to know each other? How are we going to find each other? And somehow we ended up with the idea of I would carry Gollum Van Loan volume, you know, first edition. <laughs> and um, he would spot it. So I was walking around Terminal 1 with this book, <laughs> getting, getting all sorts of funny looks until eventually Sven spotted me. And then we, we joined up and uh, took the flight together. Um, another hero of mine is Don Knuth, of course. And I'm sure to many of you. And I'll mention just two things of the many things he's done. The Art of Computer Programming book series. This is the uh, volume two, second edition, semi numerical <laughs> algorithms. <coughs> so this is the, the book that contains, in particular, a chapter on floating point arithmetic. And uh, <laughs> that's where I learned a lot about floating point from, from that book. He has some nice error analysis. He talks about things like computated summation. Um, some a number of things you couldn't find anywhere else. Now, I can't remember if it was that book or others, but I, like Sven and others, have um, dared to send Don a potential typo emails, and I have got also a check on my wall for you know what two dollars fifty six or something. So uh, there must be a lot of money sitting on checks that have <laughs> that have never been cashed. And then there's the tech book. So I first used tech when I visited Stanford in 1984 at the invitation of June Gollum. And uh, when I came back, I was able to get tech running on a PC clone about 1986. And so the tech book, I've got two copies of the tech book, one at work, one at home, which everyone should do, um, heavily thumbed. Um, and um, yeah, amongst my most um, used books, <clears throat> if there's one tool I could not live without, it is tech. Even Emacs I could live without, but you know, not, not tech, I could, could not live without tech. Um, we saw a photo that Rob, um, no, the Sven showed of Don Knuth at the 2016 Sam Annual Meeting in Boston with, with Thomas and Freddie. I've got a couple of other photos from that meeting. Now, just for context, Don Knuth wrote tech. For the younger people in the audience, tech and LaTeX are not the same thing. Don had nothing to, whatsoever to do with LaTeX. LaTeX was written by Leslie Lamport. It's essentially a package that sits on top of tech. And most of us use LaTeX, maybe not Nitro Um Almost everyone uses LaTeX nowadays. Everyone except Knuth uses LaTeX. <laughs> <laughs> um, but somehow or other, Des managed to get Don to, to stand with his LaTeX book. I don't know quite how he managed to do that, but there he is. Don advertising. Um, learning LaTeX. <laughs> and another interesting point, let me ask this question, and Rob Corliss is not allowed to answer this. 
What is Don Knuth's most cited paper? Anybody know? No, his most cited paper, Lambda W, and Rob Corliss is a co-author of that paper. And so Rob asked me to take this photo of Rob and Don, a sort of Lambert W reunion in 2016 in Boston. <clears throat> Kahan um, has been mentioned um, as one of the key people behind the IEEE floating point standard. Um, he publishes very, very little, <coughs> almost nothing actually. Um, and one of my big missions over the years has been to get hold of anything he has written even if not published. So I've had to be a bit of a detective to do this. Um, it's known that Knuth um, was a consultant to HP for many years for their calculators. And I, I learned that this manual, Advanced Function Handbook HP 15C, although it never, it doesn't mention Kahan's name anywhere in the book, it's essentially describing Kahan's work. And believe it or not, that, that manual includes background analysis, condition numbers, all, course, all kinds of sort of undergraduate level, but non-trivial numerical analysis. So that's actually a great read with a lot of Knuth, uh, Kahan type, type stuff in there. But <clears throat> most of what Kahan has done has been published in these, um, these little notes he writes. In the old days, he would print them on his dot matrix printer. I think he had a customized uh, fonts and a customized word processor. And he'd give them out to colleagues at Berkeley and Stanford um, and so the only way you could get them was to visit Berkeley or Stanford and say to Gene Gullib or Jim Demmel, have you got any um, notes by Kahan I could look at and photocopy? So I did a lot of that, and I managed to collect quite a lot of them. Um, and I included a number of these results from Kahan in, in my book, Accuracy and Stability of Numerical Algorithms. And I always felt that one of the main things I did in that book was just to publicize, you know, make available some of these results by Kahan, because otherwise they're just buried in filing cabinets that with most people have got no access to whatsoever. Um, now, a number of them are, have been scanned and are on the web, if you look on Kahan's webpage. But I would say it's only, you know, a small percentage of the things he's written are, are available there and, and the more recent ones. But there's a lot of really good stuff in these short one to typically 10 page um, unpublished notes uh, from which I've learned a lot. <clears throat> How to Solve It by George Pollier is a million selling book that I'm sure many people here have read. And in fact, everybody should read. You should all read that at some point, uh, the younger people in the audience. Um, a lot of the book consists of <coughs> 69 heuristics for problem solving. And they're illustrated with rel relatively elementary mathematics. So everyone should read it and then be aware of those heuristics and, and then think about applying them. And I'm sure those of us who did read the book many years ago kind of automatically apply these sorts of heuristics when we're doing our research. Um, Dennis mentioned that we met in 2010. And um, I found out at the time that Dennis had written a couple of books on creativity in, in the 90s. There's one here called Unlock Your Mind. <clears throat> Incredibly, that cost me 2p on Amazon. It's, uh, <laughs> So if you want to get Dennis's early books, there are quite a lot available at ridiculously low prices, at least when I last checked. Um, and of, of course, this led, so our collaborations led to us writing <coughs> the recent Cyan book. Um, and I was thinking about the connection between um, Polya, Polya's book and, and what we've done. And one way to think of it is that um, problem solving is a very specific task. The, the notions of creativity are much more general and apply to almost anything in life, in fact. And so, although it's useful to know the heuristics of problem solving, nowadays I prefer to think in terms of the creativity mindset. Uh, and the advantage of that is that knowing some techniques of creativity, you can apply them in any circumstance, even if you're not feeling particularly creative. So there are techniques we describe in the book that you can just apply um, somewhat routinely, and there's, there's a good chance you'll get something useful out of it. So one thing I've, I've learned from this process is that thinking the bigger picture of creativity, I think, is, is, is helpful. And uh, we recently had a workshop for the NLA group just before Easter um, in a hotel just outside Manchester. Here's a, a picture from it. And um, there is, as there always is with Dennis's workshops, a printed report. <coughs> if anyone wants to look, 
look at this over, over lunch. I'll leave it out on the table. So there's a whole lot of things we came up with from, from the workshop of things we want to do over the next few months um, and, and beyond. Um, and one of the things we noticed, I mean, we, we had both technical problems we were looking at as well as less technical things like um, just promoting the group. We realized that we didn't have a logo. So we said, okay, one of the outputs of this workshop is we need to design a logo. <laughs> so when we got back, we organized a competition within the group to design a logo. We had a number of entries and uh, Max Fassi, uh, where's Max? There's Max. So Max um, has the winning entry and it's um, shown here. And just in case you aren't aware, the B is the symbol of Manchester. So the Manchester B symbolizes the hard work of Mancunians during, during the Industrial Revolution, which began in the Northwest of England, of course. And so Max has got this very nice way of uh, producing a B as a sparsity pattern of a matrix. So, so thanks for that, Max. And there are plenty of other things we'll be following up over the coming months. It might seem a bit odd that I haven't mentioned Wilkinson yet. <laughs> um, so Sven mentioned the rounding errors book from 63 and the algebraic eigenvalue problem in 65. Um, the rounding errors and algebraic processes went out of print. It was reprinted by Dover and it's again gone out of print. <laughs> the good news is that Siam were this, this week going to, I believe, approve it to appear in the classic series. I've not had confirmation of that, but I'm sure that will have happened. So it will continue to survive. Um, so this is a fairly short book, hundred and just over 100 pages. The AEP is a much bigger, really thick book. <clears throat> they didn't have such an influence on me early in my career because of the existence of Stuart, Parlett, Goldman Malone, which were much more recent at the time, more accessible, and somehow, you know, to a young person, more exciting. But over the years, of course, I've made a lot of use of these books um, and, and found them <clears throat> very important. And, and of course, these books included both fixed point arithmetic, floating point, and even block floating point, which is a kind of mixture between the two. And those ideas are coming back into fashion somewhat. Fixed point arithmetic is now um, used on FPGAs and all kinds of things. So of, often things that seem to go out of fashion come, come back again. Now, if you look on Wilkinson's Google Scholar page, which was set up by Sven, you'll find that the AEP, I think, is his most cited item. And it's very well cited. So an interesting question is, why do people cite the AEP? What do they cite it for? Well, the first two chapters of the book are, are theory, background theory. <coughs> it's basic matrix theory. It's things like drawn canonical form, Hoffman, VLAN, perturbation result, Bauer Fike, um, elementary divisors, um, Hermitian matrices and their eigenvalues, um, <coughs> Sherman Morrison formula, all that kind of basic stuff is in the first two chapters, presented in Wilkinson's inimitable, uh, very precise, elegant way. And of course, at the time, 1965, there weren't many books you could go to, to to find that information. But people are still citing it today for those same chapters. And you, you can just see that by looking at how the book is cited. So even though that book is now, you know, what, 45 years old, um, 55 years old, it, it's still as valid as ever. I mean, generally, but in particular, the matrix theory aspects are, are valid, are, are just as valid as ever. So I'll come back to that in just a moment. So this is my final slide. Uh, one of my SIAM from the president columns was entitled In Search of the Perfect Numerical Analysis Textbook. And um, John DePillis managed to summarize the article almost in one cartoon, um, although not quite. But what I was saying in the article was, everyone has a slightly different take on what an NA course should contain and how it should be taught. And there will always be a need for new textbooks because people are forever changing their ideas on that. And in addition, new ideas come along. Barycentric polynomial interpolation is fairly new, only just starting to make its way into textbooks, for example. So there'll always be a, a, a need for new textbooks. People will continue to write them and they'll continue to be published and sold. But I'm not really in search of the perfect numerical analysis textbook. Um, I've got a whole shelf of them. You know, what I've got is okay. I can, I can always write my own notes. What I'm in search of is more books on matrix analysis, but books with a focus on the more practical aspects of matrix analysis from the more numerical or algebra uh, angle. 
What are, can you name a book like that? Um, well, Paul and Johnson is the obvious one. Second edition of their Matrix Analysis text, 2013. I've got two copies, one at home, one at work. It's fantastic. It's just an encyclopedia. Beyond that, you might think of, well, they also had a topics in Matrix Analysis, 1991. Can you think of any other really useful book on Matrix Analysis that's general? Um, Bellman, the audio book. I like it. Bellman? Bellman. Yeah, okay, from 1972, second edition. Um, Bartier's book on is mainly for positive definite matrices. Gant Macker, 1950s. So some of these are real, really old books, but still useful. Um, but there's not that much that's, that's more recent, and especially because I'm often looking for, in fact, Rob mentioned this the other day, he wanted some eigenvalue bounds. So where do you go if you want to find some bounds on the eigenvalues, complex eigenvalues of a complex matrix? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah, and it's can be hard to use. So I, I, I think that's what we, that's an area where we could, we could benefit from more. Uh, and I guess some of the people who could do that are in this room. Uh, people who appreciate the, the matrix analysis side and have some appreciation of what's practically valuable um, in, in the real world of numerical computing. So I'm not particularly looking for, you know, the nth generalization of Gershkorian disks to new shapes, because I, I know that they would just be so hard to compute, I might as well just compute the eigenvalues. But I am looking for conditions on the matrix being non-singular. I'm always looking for those. Those will always be useful. Um, or conditions on the eigenvalues of a matrix being in the right half plane. All these kinds of things we need all the time. And I'm always hoping I'll find something I didn't know about. But there aren't that many places to look. So that, that's my conclusion in terms of the, uh, the talk. But I also want to finish by just saying a few words um, more generally. So thank you, everybody, for coming, obviously. It's been great to, to have you here. Um, organizing this conference was actually a huge amount of work, which of course I didn't play any part in. And the people who did it all were Marcus, um, Sven, um, Stefan, and Fran, and Stephanie. Um, and so they deserve a huge round of applause for all their efforts in doing this. So thank you very much for all that, um, and um, I guess I will hand back to Fran now.